Let's look to God in prayer. Father in heaven, Father, we are gathered as your people because you have called us in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And in his name, we pray that you would come and speak to us through your word, that your Holy Spirit will make our hearts and our minds receptive, will block out all disturbances so that your word can be implanted in our hearts. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are currently in this series titled Life Beyond Sunday. And as I have said in the beginning, you know, when we started the series, while it's Sunday sermon can be a standalone sermon, to have a complete holistic biblical understanding of what we are going to talk about, you know, it's a series. And I invite you to join us for the complete series. And last Sunday, we spoke about God's design for work. And we saw that work in itself has intrinsic worth. Because work was there before sin and evil entered the world. And God worked himself. We also saw that in God's work of creating the universe, we see a pattern for our own work. And we also talk about our work as stewardship of God's creation. A trust that he has given to us. He created us in his image so that we can represent him to his creation. So that we can be God-like in our work. And this morning, we'll pick up from where we left off last Sunday. Now, even a superficial, a cursory reading of the newspaper will tell us that something is wrong with the world. You know, in the movie Three Idiots, Amir Khan's character, you know, his mantra for when life goes wrong was or is, you know, all is well. No, but our experience of work will tell us that it is not Amir Khan who represents reality, but it is Aerosmith who is much more closer to the truth. When he sings, you know, I'm living and working on the edge because something is wrong with the world, but I don't know what it is. I can't put a finger on the pulse and say what is wrong with the world exactly. Now, the daily challenges that we face in our workplaces will tell us that there is a vast gulf that exists between work as ordained by God, as designed by God, and work as we experience it today. There exists a vast gulf. And to understand work that is true to life, and to make sense of what we do, you know, in a cubicle, at a workstation, day in and day out. You know, we cannot be like Amir Khan's character and pretend that all is well. But neither can, be, can we be Aerosmith and say that something is wrong, I know. But I can't put a finger on the pulse. Now, D.L. Moody had this to say. He said, the Bible makes for useful Christians... Because I have never saw a useful Christian who is not a student of the Bible. So therefore, this morning we will open our Bibles and then we will ask this question. Why is there such a vast gulf, a huge gap between work as designed and inaugurated by God and work as we experience it today? Even on our best days in our workplaces, why is work bittersweet. And we will look at three things. The symptoms, the source, and finally, the solution. The symptoms, the source, and finally, the solution. So first, the symptoms. Now, I follow a public figure on social media like most of us do, and I follow public figures or public personalities so that I can keep a finger on the pulse of our nation to know what is going on in our nation. 
And one such individual that I follow is a politician, is a politician from the Northeast, an upcoming politician. And he made this comment. He said that because I have tiny eyes, the people cannot determine whether I am awake or asleep when I am in a work meeting. Now my counter to that is vision in life is not about how big our eyes are or how small our eyes are. Vision in life is about keeping one eye on the past and one eye on the future so that we can make sense of our present. Now to have a complete biblical understanding of what's wrong with work, of our daily work, we need to keep one eye on the past. You know, what went wrong? Where did it all start going wrong? And then we need to keep one eye on the future. What is going to happen to my work in the future? So that we can make sense of what we do, of what we work in the present. Now we all remember our first job. I do. You know, I would be the first one to raise my hand whenever the boss would say, hey, is there anyone who will do this job? I would be the first one to reach office. I would be the last one to leave office because what they say, I was wet behind the ears. And there was this spark in my eye. You know that with what I do, I'm going to change the world. But as days turn to month and month turn to years, day in and day out, the spark slowly disappeared. And I realized that to make a significant difference in the world, it takes back-breaking hard work. Work is difficult. Now, a lawyer from our church shared this with me. So one of the most difficult challenges that I face in my workplace is what do I do with a client who claims to be a Christian but is charged with corruption? Or, what do you do when your immediate line supervisor at your workplace doesn't give you credit for your hard work, but he uses your hard work to further his career? What if your hard work is not acknowledged because your colleagues think that you are a woman and then your bosses are being kind to you? One of our members of our church shared this with me, that in her work as a public official, she sometimes feels meaningless and empty when work is being done at the cubicle because the beneficiaries of what she does is so far removed from her daily work. She can't see how her work is benefiting the beneficiaries. No more than a meaningless cog in a giant wheel. Now, these are just a few of the challenges that we face in a workplace. The difficulty and the disillusionment with work is what Ecclesiastes talks about. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, and also chapter 2, verses 17. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. And chapter 2, verse 17. Absolute futility, says the teacher. Absolute fut futility. Everything is futile. What does a person gain for all his efforts that he labors at under the sun? Therefore, I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me. For everything is futile and the pursuit of the wind. The NIV says this, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. 
Now, two important words in these verses carry the weight of what we just read. One is translated variously as futility, meaningless, and vanity. Now, the other word is translated uniformly, uniformly as gain, profit. Now, we all know gain and profit is a commercial term. So what this verses is saying, or what this verses is questioning is, when all that goes into your hard work, the investment that you put into your hard work, is balanced on the weighing scales of life, what profit gets left over? Work can be a meaningless chasing of the wind, like trying to grasp vapor in your fist. Now when the ultimate gain doesn't measure up to the investment that you have made, when the sir and the bitter outnumbers the sweet, the joy derived from work can be fleeting, can be like a vapor. Now, but these are all outward symptoms and indications of a deeper problem to which we now turn. Now, if these are the symptoms, all the problems and issues that we face at our workplaces, these are but just a few, are symptoms of the actual root problem. Now, what is the root problem? What is the source of the problem? And that is what we turn to next, the source. Now, whenever we go visit a doctor, you know, the first thing that a doctor will do is ask you questions about how do you feel? Does it pain here? Does it ache here? He's trying to understand your symptoms so that he can connect your symptoms to the root cause. You know, what is the root cause that is bringing out those symptoms? Now, I remember, you know, when I was in Bangalore in uh, doing my uh, studies in seminary, you know, I had to visit a doctor, an orthopedic and I tell you, this doctor, you know, my name has four words. So my name goes to Song Monbor in T Qatar. It's very long. Now this guy, he had only, you know, one name. But one line is in his visiting card was not enough to write down all the accomplishments and degrees that he has in life. So he started asking me questions about, you know, where does it pain? What happens to you? And I shared with him. Now, this doctor was supposed to tell me the cause, was supposed to connect the symptoms to the underlining problem, but he could not. But unlike the doctor who could not connect the symptoms to the source, the Bible does it for us. And the Bible has only one word to tell us what is the source of the problems. Just one word, sin. And today's sin is not something that we talk about because it's not palatable. That, that is why we have phrases like the ice cream was sinfully delicious. But God doesn't hate sin capriciously. There is a perfect reason why God hates sin and why sin is an abomination to him. And this is what Genesis, Genesis 3 tells us is the source of all the problems that we face in our work, sin. Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 to 7. Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 to 7. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The root cause of all our problems with work is sin. Now, in our workplaces, our bosses and our colleagues may not be able to make that connection that the issues and the problems that we have with work, the root cause is sin. But we are Christians. 
And we are gathered together as partners, as Delhi Bible Fellowship Central. You know, it has Bible there. Which means the Bible is the interpretive lens that we use to make sense of life and to make sense of the challenges that we face in our workplaces. So thus far, we have spoken about the symptoms and we have connected the symptoms to the source, that is sin. Because we work in a world sustained by God, but disordered by sin. Now the question to me would be, how do we work in a fallen world? How do we work in a world where sin has fractured, where sin has broken the shalom of creation? And that is what we turn to next, the solution. Now the immediate result for our sin, as we see in Genesis 3, is alienation from God. And when we are alienated from God, we are not just alienated from God, but we are alienated from His purposes and His plans, and His plans for His creation. We are alienated from all of those. See, sin is not just disobeying the Ten Commandments. Sin is everything and anything that is against human flourishing. In fact, God gave the Ten Commandments so that in a world that is riddled by sin, the Ten Commandments can protect the shalom of the world. God, the God we worship, is all about human flourishing. He is for the shalom of this world. And that is why, exactly why he is against sin. But now that Christ has ended that alienation for us, how should our work look like in our weak work? See, for us as Christians, we don't only live and work outside Eden, but we live and work on this side of the cross after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I suggest two things as we start work tomorrow, Monday, and also the week following thereafter. You know, practice the presence of God in your workplaces and practice hopeful realism. Practice the presence of God in your workplaces and practice hopeful realism. Realism. On this side of the cross, Christ has paid the penalty and we are no longer alienated from God, even in our workplaces. Now we can partner God again through the work that we do from Monday to Friday, from Monday to Saturday, which means the work that we do is not just work, but it's your ministry, it's your service. This worship, where you worship God through the work that you do. This was beautifully put across to me by one of our very own from this church. When the person told me that I am an ambassador for Christ in my workplace. And God is using my work to seek the flourishing of the city and also to seek the flourishing of humankind. The work that we do from Monday to Friday is not just work, but it's much more than that. It's our service to God. It's our ministry. And one sure way how we can ensure that we live and practice the presence of God in our workplace is by praying without ceasing in our workplaces. I'll, tell, I'll share a story that uh, CEO of a very well-known company uh, shared this with us. So the company, their organization, came under scrutiny. We live in difficult times. We live, in, we live and work in difficult times. And they came under scrutiny. And the official said that if you don't want to lose certain privileges, legal privileges, then you'll have to give us a bribe. You'll have to give us something under the table. But these CEOs decided that I'm not going to do that as a Christian. 
And sure enough, you know, their privileges were suspended. But they kept on praying even after their privileges were suspended. They kept on asking God to intervene. And sure enough, God intervened. And that official who had suspended their privileges was transferred. And another official came in that person's place. And that person restored the privileges. The power of praying in our workplaces. Practicing the presence of God in our workplaces. Practice hopeful realism. Now Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, had this to, to say about prisoners of war. He said those who survived the prison had a hopeful realism. They know or they knew that they were in it for a long haul. So when Christmas after Christmas came without them being released, released they were realistic. They were in it for the long haul. But they also know that victory will ultimately be theirs. Those prisoners of war, they survived the prison camps. For us as Christians, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a sure guarantee that victory will be ours. And that is why, you know, we sing that song whenever Christmas comes around. You know, sin entered the world, but God in Jesus Christ also entered that sinful world. And we sing, you know, no sin or sorrow should grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He has come to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found. That you may be going through difficult times in your workplaces. You may be disillusioned with work. But what you do from Monday to Friday matters to God. Yes, we are not saved by our works. We are saved by grace through faith alone. But we are saved with our works, along with our works. We are not saved by works, saved by grace through faith alone. But we are saved along with our works. So what we do here matters to God. And a new heavens and a new earth, God will give finishing touches to what we do and make it perfect. Therefore, there are people of God who gathered as DBF Central. So we have connected the problems of work to the underlining cause, sin. The symptoms to the root cause, sin. And let us live out God's design for our work. The Christ has paid the penalty, so we need not be alienated from God in our workplaces. But we can partner God to seek the flourishing of the city, to seek the flourishing of humankind. And we can do that by practicing the presence of God in our workplaces and by practicing a hopeful realism because we work in a world that is still fallen but we look forward to the new heavens and the new earth. And now as we come around God's table, let us remind ourselves that the God we worship entered our world. The word of God says, that God put on flesh and dwelt among us. Which means God took on a physical form and matter is important to him. This world on which we work, in which we work, is not going to be annihilated but it's going to be restored, just as his body rose from the dead. That also reminds us of the blood that he shed for us, that has ended our alienation with God. And we can partake with God in his mission of restoring 
human flourishing, the shalom of this world. Let us partake of the bread together. Let us drink of the cup together. Father in heaven, Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who took on flesh, took on matter, to remind us that this world is important to you. And the work that we do in this world and on this world for you matters to you, O Lord. Therefore, remind us again through your Holy Spirit and may your word that has been implanted in our hearts and our minds influence and transform how we work from Monday to Saturday, that we may partner you in what you are doing, O Lord, in restoring the shalom, the flourishing of your creation. Help us to practice your presence in our workplaces by praying without ceasing about anything and everything about what we go through in our workplaces. But help us also to practice a hopeful realism so that we will not be extremely optimistic, but neither will we be extremely pessimistic. But may your resurrection remind us that our work matters and that you will add your finishing touches to what we do in the new heavens and the new earth that we look forward to. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. And God's people say, Amen. Thank you for joining us. See you all next Sunday.